All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. You have me, Jane Stevens, here facilitating today's webinar. And I'm super excited about this topic. I've just updated these slides because this is something that is always evolving, always changing. Um, certainly, we're seeing it right now in our market, lots of multiple offers. So we're gonna talk about how to handle multiple offers um, on both sides. So whether you're representing the buyer who's you know, up against a bunch of offers or representing the seller and how to stay organized and what your obligations are um, when you're on the listing side. So lots to cover today. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody can hear me and see the slides okay. I'll make sure I'm recording and we'll get started. All right, so as I said, let's start with buyers. Let's talk about what happens when we are representing buyers in multiple offer situations. Let's first of all talk about how do we even know if we're gonna be in a multiple offer situation? Sometimes it's pretty clear. Um, sometimes you'll come across a listing that should clearly be listed for much higher than it is. Oftentimes they're listed for that magic 999 number, 799. Um, that seems to be the, um, the trend for listing properties. Um, when they are being positioned for multiple offers. So um, as I said, they're usually priced slightly lower than um, you know, what they should be. So slightly lower than market value. So you'll definitely be able to note that way, but then it should be clear in the brokerage remarks that they are delaying offers. So um, maybe they are delaying offers for um, the following week. Um, in this case, it says they are delaying offers until 7 p.m. on May 8th. Um, and then registering, they're asking for you to register offers by 5 p.m. So they know how many to expect and they can of course disclose that. So something that I'm noticing right now is that instead of saying this, I'm seeing this and you guys can confirm with me as well, um, but I'm seeing this in the brokerage remarks that um, instead of delaying offers, what they're doing is they're requesting that you submit an offer with 48 hours irrevocable. And this essentially will um, result in multiple offers as well. Uh, the reason for that is because if they are requesting an irrevocable of 48 hours, what ends up happening is everybody who has shown the property before um, and anybody who is scheduled to view the property, they are basically going to be notified that there's an offer. So this basically gives everybody 48 hours to also submit an offer, quickly go see the property if they haven't already, and then submit an offer if they are interested. So even though they're not delaying offers here, I am noticing that this is something new that people are putting in the brokerage remarks. The listing agents are using this strategy um, in order to generate multiple offers um, without specifically delaying them for a certain date. So um, again, let me just admit a few people who are joining us still. Um, so again, this is um, generating multiple offers. So if you see this, you might want to let your clients know that there's a chance that you will be in a multiple offer situation. So um, another way that this comes up or something that happens, oh, okay, sorry guys, I have people joining. So let me just admit everybody here. Awesome, awesome. Okay, <laughs> sounds good, multitasking. All right. Um, so this also happens sometimes where offers are being presented, um, but then the seller also reserves the right to view preemptive offers. This is not my favorite. I'm sure if you guys are representing buyers, this probably isn't your favorite either, because basically it's saying both things, that they are going to delay offers, but really they're accepting offers anytime, right, by reserving the right to entertain preemptive offers. All right, I still have people joining. Let me just make sure everybody's here. Okay, um, awesome. So yeah, as I said, sometimes they will be delayed. There will be an offer presentation date, but then at the same time they're asking for, or they're, or they're saying that the seller reserves the right to entertain preemptive offers. If that's the case, again, you can let your clients know there's an opportunity here to present an offer before offer presentation date. But if you are gonna talk to your clients about that, really make sure that you have a strong offer. Um, speaking to the listing agent, we'll talk about all of this in the upcoming slides, but really speaking to the listing agent and trying to get a sense of what it is that they're expecting. Now, of course, the listing agent can't give you a number, but they might be able to share comparables with you that they're relying on. I had a situation recently where the property was listed for $7.99. Uh, the buyers were very interested. They wanted to submit a firm offer for $8.50. So I called the listing agent and asked, are they even gonna be in the ballpark at 850? Is this something that you would entertain preemptively? And the listing agent shared with me a comparable that had sold for 900,000 and that's what, was, what the seller was expecting. 
So right there, I knew that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be worth doing the preemptive offer. So have a conversation, try to figure out if you can, what the seller's expectations are. Of course, as I said, you're not going to get the exact number, but hopefully you have a listing agent um, that will steer you in the right direction as to whether or not um, your offer will be considered. All right. So, and then just, of course, disclosing that to the buyers and letting them know. I know right now it's really discouraging for buyers who are looking at properties that are priced for $7.99 and their budget is $8.50 uh, because in some situations, like the example that I just gave, they'll go for even more than the $8.50 mark. So just knowing the market and knowing what's happening um, so that you can educate your clients and inform them on really what it's going to sell for. All right. So if they do want to proceed with the offer, um, again, using this example of a property that was listed for $9.99, make sure that you are going in and you're doing the comparables and you're taking a look at what has recently sold. And it may be that, yes, this particular property has previously been listed. This is a good example of one that was, it's currently listed for $9.99. But if you look at the address history, so in addition to the CMA that you're going to prepare to look at other comparables, take a look at the address history and see if that's been previously listed. So you can see here that um, the list price is currently $9.99, but it was previously terminated for $1.469, $1.479. So if your clients are going in with what they think is a good offer of $1.1, um, clearly the seller's expectations are in the $1.4 range. So uh, this particular property, I remember it, it did go into multiples. I believe a whole bunch of people offered $1.1 to $1.2 and uh, it didn't sell. So it was ultimately terminated. So um, sometimes they do sell in competition and other times they're just priced too low and the market is just not going to support that uh, the seller's expectations. All right. Let me see. I've got some comments coming in. People still joining. <laughs> okay. I have a preemptive offer on my listing. So here's a question. It is expiring six hours before offer presentation. Seller likes the offer, but also wants to see what happens with the bidding. How do you deal with this? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, and I'll, I'll say right now also, it's a preemptive offer on your listing and whoever that agent is um, has, has strategized well here, right? Because they don't want the seller to look at other offers, right? They want, uh, they're presenting a good offer and they're um, trying to make it as appealing as possible for the seller just to accept theirs um, and not consider other offers, right? So the timing of that was no accident, um, but definitely talk to your sellers what you want to do. So there is, um, of course, a couple of things. There's going to be risk involved if they decide to put this offer aside and proceed with the offer presentation, see what other offers come in. It may be that they do get a better offer, but of course there's a risk that maybe this is the best offer they're going to get. So, I mean, you can also let this particular agent know that, um, you know, perhaps your seller does want to see all of the other offers and to extend their irrevocable. So they may or may not do that. So have a conversation with your seller and uh, see what they want to do. But uh, ideally, you want to see if this um, offer will extend their irrevocable. Although, you know, I doubt they will. They're wanting to, um, you know, get this accepted before being in competition. So it's, yeah, that's a tricky um, situation. And definitely you have a buyer's agent there who is um, aggressive <laughs> and really wants the property. So that's what makes multiple offers um, kind of exciting and nerve wracking all at the same time. All right, so I'm still admitting people, awesome. <laughs> okay, let's keep going here. So how do you know what's happening in the market? Hopefully you guys are busy in your own areas. You know what's happening, you know what's selling. Um, you know, this is something that you should incorporate into your day that you're looking at the properties that you've shown previously to um, other clients and updating them on what they sold for. This also informs you, as I said, as to what happens or what is happening in the market. So another tool that you can use is of course the Zolo website. So going into any area, just typing in Toronto in this particular case, and you'll notice that there is something called market stats. So if you see that there, if you click on it, it's gonna tell you what's been going on in the market. So you can see here right now, average days on market are 16 days, and the average is that listings are selling for over ask, right? So um, really letting your clients know that this is the market we're in right now. And then of course, you'll want to do a deeper dive into that particular property that they're interested in, so you can tell them what that particular property should go for. So here's an example of a listing in Toronto. It's a Zolo listing, it's listed for 1.099. Um, and if you scroll down, you're gonna see this section here that's called home value. Um, and uh, you just click on the plus sign next to home value and it'll give you 
this information. So it's going to tell you that this particular property um, or similar properties like it in the area have sold for 1.088. So this particular property has, has been priced well and isn't positioning itself for multiple offers. Although, of course, as we know, that may still happen. So this is where you can find some information. So if you were to look at a property that um, in the example that I used earlier is listed for $7.99, but you go to the Zola website, you click on home value, and you see that properties in that area are selling for 900 plus, then, um, then you know what the sellers are, are gonna be expecting, right? It's priced really low. Um, and you wanna be telling your clients that as well. I think it's fair um, for listing agents to price their property um, slightly lower than market value to generate interest, but the example of pricing it for 799, expecting 900, um, that's a hundred thousand dollar difference. So I think that you know there's a lot of buyers that end up looking at that property who whose budget you know that's not even in their budget, right? So maybe eight fifty is their max. So if you are going to be positioning um, properties for multiple offers, do price it aggressively, but not so low that you're going to end up with you know twenty three offers and you know hundreds of showings, especially during um, you know times like these. Uh, with people that just aren't going to be able to uh, reach whatever it is that the seller is expecting, right? So don't price it so low. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about the seller side in a minute. All right. So on the buyer side, you definitely need to have a strategy. So you want to have the right approach and you want to be talking to your buyers about uh, how to position your offer um, the best way possible so that it is most attractive to the seller. So one of the first things you're going to want to do is talk to the listing agent. Be best friends with the listing agent. Ask them what the sellers are expecting in terms of a possession date and try to give that to them. Oftentimes buyers can be flexible with that um, and then it comes down to uh, obviously price and condition. So talk to the listing agent, find out what the possession date um, is or what they're hoping for and hopefully you can line that up. If they are gonna be allowing offers to be presented in person, that's something else that you can offer to do. Make sure that your clients are available either way. So whether you're emailing the, the offer or you're presenting it in person, make sure that your clients know what time the offers are gonna be presented, how long it should take. So if they're accepting offers at five, they're presenting at seven, hopefully you should hear back in about an hour or so. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, uh, but if the listing agent calls you back wanting to know if you'll change certain things about your offer, you want to be able to contact your clients. The horrible situation to be in where your clients aren't picking up at that point, and you know that not only are you in competition, but there's tight timelines. So make sure that you do have your clients available. We don't always have the opportunity to present in person, but if that's available to you, then it does make it um, a little bit more of a personal approach. So here are the things that you can negotiate. As I said, the closing date, hopefully you can line that up with the seller's expectations, give them what they want. The deposit is typically going to be 5% of the purchase price. Um, if you're able to offer more, that just shows that your buyer is qualified, financially able, really serious, putting skin in the game. So if you're able to encourage them to uh, provide more of a deposit, then definitely encourage that. It is refundable, of course, um, if there are conditions and they're not satisfied with the conditions. But the next thing I'm going to say is going in as clean as possible. So offering, um, you know, the cleanest possible um, offer in terms of maybe removing that financing condition if they already have um, financing in place and maybe even going so far as removing the inspection. Some listing agents, if they are, um, you know, positioning themselves for multiple offers, hopefully they are going to um, prepare perhaps a pre-listing inspection so that um, you can see the report before going in with your offer um, so that your buyers feel comfortable removing that condition because there's an inspection report that they can already take a look at. So a pre-listing inspection report that was prepared by the sellers, that's something that hopefully can be shared beforehand so that you can go in without that condition. Similar to that, if you have a listing agent who is uh, you know, listing a condo, hopefully they have the status certificate available so you're not going in with that condition. So if the listing agent has helped you along the way um, in disclosing all of the documents, that will help your buyer do their due diligence um, beforehand so that they can go in feeling comfortable removing those conditions, right? And not just going in blindly. So uh, hopefully they have that available. If they don't do a pre-listing inspection, then perhaps what you can offer is instead of going in with uh, you know, five days, which is typical for financing and inspection to be confirmed, perhaps you present your offer saying, we are uh, requesting an inspection, but we're gonna get it in 
done in two days. We've already scheduled the appointment with the inspector. He's available tomorrow in the afternoon. You know, if we can, if you can accept our offer, we'll get that condition removed as quickly as possible. So that's another way that you can sort of position your offer uh, slightly better than any others, hopefully. And then of course it comes down to purchase price. So this is really gonna be a conversation with your clients. Yes, you can show them comparables, but then also have a discussion with them about um, losing it, right? Um, if it were to go for $5,000 more, would you regret not offering 5,000, right? Have that latter conversation with them and see really how much they're willing to pay. And you know, some buyers will say, you know what? I don't want to pay more than 830,000. I don't think, you know, it's worth more than that. And if it goes for 850, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Fine. Then you know your <laughs> your uh, clients have a number in mind, they're comfortable with it and they don't want to push past that. Having said that, if their number is 830, something that you might want to suggest to them as well is maybe offering something that's a bit of an odd number. So how about we go in with 8335? because there might be somebody else who offers 830. Maybe that's a really attractive number. Um, so offering just a little bit more might, uh, again, position your, your offer um, better than the rest. I'm gonna talk about the escalation clause as well coming up here, but let's see what questions I have coming in. Uh, Pre-listing inspection report can be asked before we submit the offer. Yes, absolutely. So again, anytime you are thinking about presenting an offer, always reach out to the listing agent. You want to be asking about the closing date, but certainly ask them if they have a pre-listing inspection report available. Uh, if they do, they usually state that somewhere in the remarks. Um, if not, then um, you might want to ask for it, but it's not likely that they have it. But definitely ask for it um, before submitting an offer. Um, okay, so a lot of listing agents double end and try not to present offers from cooperating agent. What is the best strategy to counter them? So in that situation, you might want to ask if you can present in person so that you know that you are getting um, you know, a fair shot at it. Um, but this one can be tricky. Um, obviously, they're not supposed to do this. So hopefully this is not, you know, the norm. This is kind of something that you might encounter. But if you do feel that your listing agent is not representing your offer fairly, then maybe get your, um, get Kevin involved, have, um, you know, our managing broker deal with their managing broker. Um, yeah, especially if there is multiple representation involved. So that's something that you may want to consider. All right, so let's talk about, hopefully this is the next slide here, the escalation clause. Um, nope, before I jump into escalation clause, if you are telling your clients to remove conditions, then definitely make sure that you're either crossing them out in the Schedule A. So for example, you have financing condition, the inspection condition, and then you can just strike it and then have your buyers initial those two clauses saying that uh, basically they're aware that they're removing that condition. Also have uh, form 127, which will verify that they are um, acknowledging that they are waiving the condition or not including a certain condition um, with respect to financing or the sale of their home, maybe, um, whatever it is, the home inspection, just initial the particular uh, circles there so that you have record of it. Um, so this is the escalation clause. So this is something that we've discussed before in other webinars, and it's a tool that has both worked for me and not worked for me. So um, it, it does work, but there will be some times that the listing agent just says, you know what, we're not gonna consider escalation clauses because if more than one buyer comes in with an escalation clause, I just don't wanna have that issue. So fine, fair, but try it. As I said, it has worked. I know other agents um, you know, that I speak to that have said that it has worked for them as well. This is basically the wording. Uh, really what it does is uh, you should be submitting your offer with your, your best number, but if your client is you know, playing that ladder game and really doesn't want to lose the property, then maybe you go in with that offer of 833, 500, and then you put in an escalation clause saying, if somebody else has an offer that's close to ours, say it's 835, um, you know, we're willing to go $1,000 over and above that. So you're still giving your best offer, um, but you're also saying, you know, if there's something else that's better, I'll, I'll go $1,000 over and above that. $1,000 is a small number when you're dealing with um, you know, properties for sale, but it could win the offer and you can certainly change that amount, right? It could be $1,000 over, $2,000 over, or $5,000 over um, a competing offer. So 
the wording here, I can share that with you guys separately in the uh, workplace group, but this is, again, something that it's a bit of a controversial clause because it is allowed, but of course, um, you know, some listing agents might not want to deal with it. Again, if there's multiple offers with multiple escalate, escalation clauses, you can see how it might be <laughs> a little bit tricky for them to navigate. So try it. It has been successful for others in the past. And uh, if you're not able to read this, I'll just quickly highlight uh, basically what this is saying is that during the irrevocable day and time that this offer remains open, if the seller receives another offer, um, so a, a competing offer that is higher than this offer, then your buyer is escalating their current offer in increments of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, whatever it is, until this offer is higher than the competing offer. So um, definitely something that you can, you can use to, again, just gain that competitive advantage when you are in competition. All right. So another thing that you can include, of course, is a buyer's letter. So this is great. Um, it's funny because sometimes we don't even know our buyers. I had a situation where, um, I mean, I knew my buyers. I knew what they were all about. I knew that they loved their prop the, the property that I had shown them and the property that we were going to be competing for. But when they prepared the buyer's letter, I didn't realize that she was um, expecting their second child. So that was something that she put in the letter saying that, uh, you know, the townhouse was in the neighborhood that she grew up in, um, you know, and they were expecting their second child. They were, you know, excited to, um, you know, live in the community where she grew up. It was a beautiful letter, very well written. Uh, so something I also recommend that you do. Uh, of course, we're always, you know, trying to introduce our, our clients in the best possible way, but sometimes we don't know details that, uh, you know, might be helpful as well. So include a family photo. I always love suggesting that. So something that they prepare, um, so that the seller knows who it is that they're selling their property to. And they may resonate with them. You know, maybe they bought uh, the property when, uh, you know, they were also growing their family, whatever the situation is. So hopefully you can create that personal connection. And something, if you really want to level this up, instead of it just being a buyer's letter, maybe you ask your clients to record a video of themselves, right? So, I mean, we're in a virtual world right now. Why not ask them to send something um, like that? Quick video on their phone. You know, and you can present that with the with the offer. All right, I have some questions coming in. So before we jump into sellers, let me address your questions here. All right, so um, I uh, let me see where do I get this form? Let me know what form you're referring to. If it's 127 um, in web forms, all of the forms are there, and you can just download that um, or add it to your transaction kit. Um, okay, so. If we don't know what the other offer is offering, how can we guarantee no playing is happening? So we never know what the offer, what the other offer is. We just have to rely on each other as professionals that uh, you know they are going to um, act fairly, right? And that's really what um, what we're all here to do. Of course, there will be times where you know maybe you don't feel like the offer presentation went well um, or was or was conducted fairly. Then definitely you know reach out to uh, the managing broker here at Zolo, Kevin Ali, and then, um, you know, we, he can discuss with their broker, uh, you know, what, what happened. And maybe, you know, you have those 801s disclosed to you to verify that, yes, in fact, there were other offers. Um, so, yeah, definitely, you know, sometimes things escalate into complaints, but uh, hopefully that's not the norm. All right. So, yes, Form 127 you can find in web forms, and the escalation clause is... Uh, wording that I can share with you. So I'll post it in the workplace group in the training chat. So once this gets uploaded to YouTube, I will share that with you guys. All right, so let me know how we're doing with that. Let's jump into representing sellers. So this is where it gets a little bit more involved. So let's talk about, uh, this is kind of our agenda for talking about multiple offers when you're representing sellers. So let's talk about some basic rules, first of all. Um, so Anytime that you have a listing, of course, we must disclose the number of offers to anyone who has written an offer. We also need to disclose multiple representation. So if you and another agent at Zolo are representing both the seller and a potential buyer, that needs to be disclosed to everyone. Also, if a buyer's agent is looking to reduce the amount of commission, that also needs to be disclosed. So really the takeaway here is Disclose, disclose, disclose. If there are any changes to the offer process, so uh, using this example here, if your client didn't want to look at any preemptive offers, um, you know, they were just gonna be looking at offers on 
a certain uh, date and time, but they've received a really good offer and now they want to look at it, you must disclose that to all of the agents who have previously viewed the property and also any agents who uh, have scheduled showing. So just disclose everything to everyone is basically going to be the basic, the basic rules. Um, of course, as I mentioned, you cannot disclose the substance of any offer. So you can't let people know if it's a good offer, it's a, if it's a bad offer, uh, certainly what the price is, you can't disclose that. So, um, but everything else you must disclose. And I have a sample of an email that I received from a listing agent. So um, I hadn't actually submitted an offer on this property yet, but um, she sent an email saying, I would like to update you on offers. There are currently four offers at the moment. I'm expecting three more. So she's really disclosing here. Uh, currently there are four offers registered as follows. So she had them listed. This is probably the most amount of disclosure that I've ever seen because she actually said who the agent was and who they were with. So we'll be looking at offers tomorrow at nine. If you have yours, please submit to me prior to 8 a.m. tomorrow. So again, this, this was a situation where I hadn't even put in an offer yet. Um, my clients were considering it. So this is something I had the information before I had even sent anything to this particular listing agent. So it was a really great way of her disclosing and keeping everybody in the loop. Because of course there are people that are sitting on the sidelines sometimes thinking about whether or not to put in an offer. So that's a listing agent that, you know, letting people know that if you are sitting on the fence, I already have four offers, I'm expecting three more, you know, please submit by 8 a.m. tomorrow. So really disclose. All right, so setting up a bidding war, let's talk about that. So having a strategy in place, if when you are at that listing presentation, you might want to talk about whether or not the client wants to set up a bidding war, uh, wants to position the property for multiple offers because that is going to affect how you price the property, um, but really talking to them also about the pros and cons of that. And also even looking at the previous listings. So for example, if it's a condo, um, you might want to look at the, the listings that are available now and anything that's sold recently and see if they held off on offers. And if it's just not the trend in that building, then maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, but if you see that, uh, you know, this building turns over quite quickly, there's a lot of competition for it, then, you know, know the building, know your market and know what to suggest here. Uh, so typically, if you do want to set an offer date into the future, usually it's about a week or so that you list the property, say on a Wednesday or Thursday, you allow showings over the course of one weekend, and then you hold off on offers until say the following Tuesday, for example. And then of course you ask them to register the offer at five, let people know that you're gonna be presenting at seven so that everybody is aware of how you've set up the offer uh, presentation date and time. So, um, again, the way you find out about how it will be, um, presented is in the brokerage remarks. And as I said, explain the pros and cons of delaying offers. So when you're in that listing presentation, let them know the pros of course are that you're gonna generate some interest, there's gonna be some competition, hopefully people wanna outbid each other. Uh, that's the best case scenario. Of course, there are times, there is a risk that maybe you delay offers for Tuesday and then you don't get any offers, right? Inevitably, you're gonna get that call on Wednesday from another agent who has a buyer sitting on the fence and you're gonna get that question, did you sell it yesterday? Did you get any offers? Um, and if it didn't sell, then now you might have that buyer who's sitting on the fence give you a low ball offer, right? Because it didn't generate the interest you thought it would. So really explaining that to your seller and really not, not suggesting those multiple offers unless you know it's a building that is in high demand or you know that it's a property that is gonna generate a lot of interest. All right, so. Um, let me just switch this slide. So again, explaining that delayed offer presentation might lead to preemptive offers. So again, knowing what your client wants to do. So again, we're talking about this now from the selling side. So if you have a seller uh, that, that yes, they've decided they want to delay offers, great, but also know that uh, preemptive offers might come in, otherwise known as bully offers. So talk to your client about what they want to do with those. Do you want to entertain those or do you want me to just um, you know, not even tell you about them. And in that case, you need written instructions from your client um, that they don't wanna know about it, they want everything presented um, on the offer presentation day and time that you have selected. Um, so yeah, this is just more of the same questions that you might wanna ask. Um, you know, do you want to be notified of a preemptive offer without seeing the details? Do you wanna see the details? Uh, do you wanna consider all offers uh, before the offer presentation date? 
So there's questions here that you can ask in order to determine really how they want to handle it. And of course, there is a form for that so that you have written instructions. Um, all right, one second here. So I'm getting some questions coming in at the same time. So I'll just finish this as well, making sure that you document your client's instructions. So, and if there's a change to their instructions at any time, you must, of course, um, also have that written. So I have seen situations where a listing agent has posted the seller's instructions to the MLS listing. So in addition to the Schedule B, uh, maybe their disclosure, if they're related to the seller, they will also have the seller's instructions there in writing saying that they are not looking at preemptive offers. So um, you know, if they really just wanna look at all offers on a certain day and time, then that's something you may wanna consider as well. Um, let me just see if I've got that form up here. I think it's coming up. Um, in the next few slides. So yeah, so dealing with preemptive offers, um, if they do come in, then yes, you do have an obligation to convey that to your seller unless, as I said, they've given you clear written instructions, which is form 244, which is what I was trying to jump ahead. So I will show that form to you in the next slide. So of course the seller is always in charge. They can change their instructions, but they have to do that in writing. So again, form 244, you have that option of uploading it to the MLS listing so that everybody is well aware of how this is gonna be handled. Um, informing the parties is a crucial next step. So you don't wanna have a situation where, oh gosh, you have an offer come in and you forget to notify somebody who maybe was scheduled uh, to see the property and they were also thinking of um, submitting an offer, right? You don't wanna miss anybody. We have technology, we have, um, you know, technology on our side, we have a really good um, system right now for uh, showings. And so it keeps track of who's been looking at the property. Um, so definitely it's, it's easier right now to let people know what's happening and what has changed, if anything. All right, so this is the form that I was talking about. So the seller's direction read property offers uh, form 244. So um, again, you just have the seller directing the, um, the conduct of how you're gonna be accepting offers. And if they don't want to receive any signed offers before a certain day and time, you would be initialing and indicating that in the first paragraph there. So that's the form that you would use. And again, you can upload that to MLS for others to see as well. So let's talk about offer registration and presentation. So again, these are instructions that you're gonna have in your brokerage remarks for the um, other agents to see so that they know uh, what time to submit offers to you. So um, here is, and a good idea to send out an email outlining the plan. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in the next slide. So when you're hosting a bidding war, send out an email to all of the agents who have shown your listing. You don't want to, of course, include them in the CC section. You wanna BCC them so you know people don't know who the other um, you know, offers might be coming from. So let them know how the offers are to be submitted. So are you gonna be accepting offers in person or are you wanting them emailed by a certain date and time? Let the agents know what the ideal closing date is so that you don't have uh, that question come back to you. Uh, deposit instructions. So, you know, is it 5,000 or sorry, 5,000, 5% of the purchase price or greater? Um, can they be, do they need to be delivered here with? So in other words, um, you know, sometimes sellers may not want to look at offers if they don't have the deposit here with, which means you're sending the buyer uh, to the bank to get their deposit and you're sending a copy of that bank draft with your offer. Um, so a listing agent may request that you do that. Um, otherwise, you know, it should be acceptable that, uh, you know, it gets delivered within 24 hours. But going back to representing buyers, um, if you really want to position your offer well against all the other ones, asking them to deliver the deposit here with is definitely a way um, to make your offer seem more attractive. Um, Letting them know what the irrevocable time should be. So again, if you are presenting offers, uh, accepting offers at five, presenting them at seven, um, you know, ask that they make the irrevocable time for maybe midnight that night, right? So it gives you enough time uh, to deal with the offers and hopefully not 9 p.m. because then, you know, you have to deal with that one really quickly. So um, ask them when you'd like the offer to be irrevocable until. And then communication, stay on top of the number of offers how you communicate uh, to the agents. Are you gonna ask them for a second round, for example? So maybe you get five offers and they're all pretty much the same. You can ask them to uh, come back with their best and final. So that's typically referred to as a second round. So, you know, letting everybody know, of course, some people will say, no, that's our, that's our best and final, but maybe you have somebody else who comes back with a better offer. So um, that's an option that you can do when you're on the listing side. Um, any special requests, definitely let them know that. Um, 
and then seller's intentions. So if they're just going to go with the highest and best, so uh, you know, submit your offers um, best and final, or if they may come back with, uh, with a second round or requesting a second round. So communication is key. All right, let me see here. So this is an example of an email that came again from that same uh, listing agent. So she, this was an email that came in before she was actually accepting offers. So letting everybody know the ideal closing date. Um, again, letting people know, um, you know, and how many registers are, sorry, how many offers are registered at the moment, how many she's expecting. And then, you know, she attached the schedule B, the disclosure form, and then again, reminding everybody that uh, she was going to be presenting at 9 a.m. and to email um, everything by 8 a.m. So that's an example of just a short and sweet email just to keep people informed. All right, so I have some questions coming in. I have somebody raising their hand. If you want to unmute yourself, go ahead, unmute yourself, and I can uh, address your question. I don't know who it was who just raised their hand. Um, otherwise, we will have time for a Q&A at the end, so I'll just get through the rest of these um, slides. So, um, okay, offer registration. So you want to make sure that the brokerage is aware of all of the offers that are coming in. So they will either call, so the buyer's agent will either call and register the offer, um, but you can double check as well and make sure that all have been accounted for. Because when the offers come in, um, as I said, our schedule lock system, which is our booking system, also keeps track of all of the offers coming in. So we do have technology on our side helping us. So you do want to be keeping track on your end, but uh, you want it to be in line with what the brokerage is sending out as well. All right, let me just switch slides here. Um, and I've already talked about this offer registration time. So, you know, you might want to say, for example, you know, send your offers in by five and then offer presentation time is at seven. The reason for that is because um, agents are sometimes late, <laughs> right, in submitting the offers. And, uh, you know, that may not be their fault. It may be buyers who, you know, are on the fence, aren't sure, are thinking about it. And then at the last minute, they want to submit um, an offer. So, um, you know, giving yourself some time in between when they register the offer and when you present it so that you do have some time to organize yourself and present it to the, uh, to the seller in an organized fashion. All right, so let's talk about dealing with um, these offers sort of behind the scenes before you present it to your, um, to your seller. You do wanna keep an ongoing list of all of the email addresses and cell phone numbers of all of the agents who have shown your listing. Again, this is something that is kept track of in schedule lock. So you will be able to notify everybody of any incoming email. Um, and of course, you wanna have also a record of those agents who have requested showing times into the future. So maybe there's an agent who hasn't shown it yet, but has a scheduled appointment for tomorrow. Let them know um, as well that you have an offer already. So really making sure that you are keeping track of all of the agents who have shown their property and then keeping a separate spreadsheet with the names and contact information for all of the registered offers. You need to have some sort of a list where you're keeping track of who has submitted what, and you can create an offer summary template with maybe some of these headings. So has the 801 been received? Yes or no. Um, who's the agent? How can you get a hold of them? What's their offer price? And this is something really nice that you can also share with the, uh, with the seller when the time comes so that they can kind of have an overview of what's being presented, right? So you have five offers and you're gonna list the offer price, the deposit amount, the irrevocable day and time, what their closing date is, do they have any conditions, did they deliver the, the offer with their, um, with their um, deposit check. So, you know, having kind of a, a column, um, a template like that, where you're disclosing all of that information in separate columns will be an easy way to high level see what the offers are. And then of course you do want to go through them each individually. Um, or maybe select the top two or three if, if you know you really have some strong offers and go through um, every word of the Schedule A to make sure that uh, you know the seller is satisfied with what it is that they're offering. All right, so at that point, the seller, of course, has an opportunity to either accept the best offer, negotiate with one offer, um, and if they do want to negotiate with one offer, then they have the option of rejecting all of the other offers or simply advising all of the other offers that their offers are being set aside while the, while the seller negotiates. Or of course, the seller can reject all offers. So in that example that I shared at the very beginning where the property was listed for $9.99, but um, it had clearly been listed before at 1.469 and 1.479, the offers that came in 
as I said, were 1.1, 1.2, well below what the seller was expecting. So in that case, that seller just rejected all of the offers. So didn't get the interest that they were hoping for. But typically, um, you're going to be in a situation where there's either a clear front runner or you're sending them all back for a second round. So, uh, you know, definitely, again, letting the other agents know where you're at um, once you have received all the offers and once you have um, considered them all and the seller is potentially working with, with one or maybe sending a couple back for uh, best and final. All right, let me see, I've got another question coming in. Registered offer is offer in writing? Yeah, so a registered offer is um, the 801. So sometimes what happens is listing agents, or sorry, buyer's agents will send the 801 to uh, the listing agent and won't actually send the entire offer until the time comes for that agent to present the offer to the seller. So um, the registered offer means that they've received the 801. All right, so something to talk about before you even get to the offer presentation, um, make sure that you are preparing your clients well before then. So you wanna be reviewing the agreement of purchase and sale so that you're not having to explain the details of the pre-printed clauses. So this is something that we talk about even with buyers, right? Before you get them to sign all of these documents, you want to make sure that they've seen them before. So again, this just goes back to your listing presentation. Share with them the forms that, that they're going to be looking at if they do get an offer, and maybe sharing those explained forms from the OREA website. And that way, you know, there is a clear, um, you know, explanation for each of those legal clauses so that you're not taking up unnecessary time uh, during the offer presentation stage to explain pre-printed clauses. So that way you can really just focus on the important parts of the agreement. So what is it that they're offering in terms of price? What's their deposit? Um, you know, are they accepting the inclusions and exclusions? That's something else you wanna go over. Are there any conditions? Are they giving you the closing date that you want? Um, and is there anything else that needs to be made note of? So really making sure that you're preparing your clients, your sellers before um, they review any offers so that you're not being held up explaining pre-printed clauses or explaining you know, what the confirmation of co-op form is all about, right? They should already know that, so that you can just talk about the details. All right, let me see here. Um, so email or in-person offers. So this is another conversation to have with your clients, with your sellers, just find out, um, you know, how they, how they wanna go about this. I think most people opt for email offers, um, but uh, some people are a little bit uh, old school still, and they like to have that in-person, um, you know, uh, personal touch to it. So if they are allowing uh, in-person offers, if you're the buyer agent, definitely allow it to happen. Um, but as I said, I mean, most times now we're just doing everything electronically and by email. So uh, yeah. All right. Um, we've talked about this as well. So there is, you know, the seller may, um, you know, just accept best and final, um, you know, sort of one round, or they may you know, ask everybody to improve, but that's not always going to be the situation. So don't tell your buyer clients if you're on the buying side that, uh, you know, you're going to have a second chance to improve because you may not, there may be a clear winner. So always, always go in with your, um, you know, your, your best foot forward, your best and final. All right. Um, yeah, the seller is always in charge. It's your job to provide strategy and counsel to help them maximize the price they receive. Um, usually once offers have been presented, you can accept the highest or best, or you can ask everyone to improve their offers, or you can choose to negotiate with one of the buyers. So uh, there isn't a solution that works every time. That's true. Um, definitely it's situational. So make sure to discuss the options with the seller uh, before offer night and then plan accordingly. All right. Okay, so this is um, a sample email. If you are the listing agent and you've decided, you know what, um, all the offers were pretty similar. We're going to ask for a second round. This is uh, a sample email that uh, I'm sharing with you. So thank you for your offer. So this is you as the listing agent sending an email to all of the buyer agents saying, thank you for your offer. We've received 23 offers, um, excluding one that has been withdrawn and including one that I'm providing customer service for. Please advise by email only by 1.30. If your client would like to make any changes to their offer, please ensure your direct phone number is in your email as well. So. There's another example of, um, you know, how you want to update all of the buyer agents. And uh, yeah, you see in the subject line here, it says update number one. That was something else that um, I took from a listing agent where, you know, she updated us multiple times. And that was just kind of nice to know. Update number one, you know, uh, come back with uh, your improved offer. Update number two, we're working with one offer. Update number three, 
it's now sold firm for X amount of money. So um, a nice way to stay organized and disclosed uh, because of course that's, that's super necessary. Multiple representation. All right, let's talk about that quickly here. Um, so multiple representation is um, if the buyer and seller are being presented by the same brokerage. So say for example, you are uh, listing a property and another Zolo agent brings you an offer on behalf of their buyer. That is a multiple representation uh, situation. And then also, of course, if you are representing multiple buyers uh, for the same property. So some basic rules, you must have written consent from both the buyer and the seller and both brokerages. You need to disclose to anyone with a written offer that you're representing both the seller and a buyer. Um, similar to that previous email that you just saw, it was disclosed that uh, that listing agent had an offer where uh, he or she was um, providing customer service, so that must be disclosed. Um, so if you're the listing agent and see that two of the offers are from the same brokerage, you have the responsibility to let your agents know that they can get informed consent from their clients. The rules for multiple representation apply whether you are in a multiple offer situation or not. So there's lots of information that you can find out about that on the RICO Bulletin, multiple representation, uh, but definitely that is um, something you need to keep in mind when in that multiple uh, offer situation. All right, commission reductions. Um, I, this happens, of course, where you know the, uh, the the buyer's agent is trying to position the buyer's offer in the best possible way, and maybe they're at their max. Maybe that's it. They can't, you know, they can't go over 850. So the buyer's agent decides, you know what, I'm going to throw in, you know, 2,300 dollars or whatever it is <laughs> to get this offer accepted. Whatever it is, um, you know, again, you're probably going to receive. Um, instructions from the listing agent as to how to deal with that and that if they're what i saw and what i i think was smart um was the listing agent just said if you're going to be offering a um you know com cash back to your buyers or whatever it is do that separately so that it's not something that you then have to worry about disclosing to everybody else right um it just can kind of get a little bit um messy so if they are going to be reducing their commission to make sure that uh, maybe they do that um separately by their own agreement and then they present the offer that the uh that you think the seller will accept so keep it separate all right last but not least the sole price so of course when you are the listing agent you cannot reveal the sole price if you have an accepted firm offer without the deposit being delivered right so you have to wait even if you have that firm offer you know it was the best one out of the bunch in a multiple offer situation if they have not delivered their deposit or it wasn't delivered herewith um, then you cannot disclose that sole price until that has been done. So let the other agents know that the property has sold, um, but definitely, you know, update them the next day whenever that deposit has been delivered. All right. Okay, so I think that was it. I don't know where the slide came from. Um, but yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions about that. That was the slide I was missing my question slide. <laughs> so a lot of information here today, but um, you know, hopefully there's uh, there's some good ideas there representing buyers. So you know, just to kind of do a quick summary, making sure that you're offering uh, the closing date that the seller requires, making sure that you're delivering, uh, you know, a good clean offer, maybe with a higher deposit, and uh, you know, presenting that buyer's letter or sending a video with your buyer saying how much they love the property. I think that would go a really long way. Um, and then of course, with the sellers, if you are wanting to um, you know, position yourself for multiple offers, get that pre-listing inspection done, get that status certificate ordered, um, allow the buyers to come in with a good clean offer um, without it being such a risk of the unknown, right? Let, let them know, uh, provide them all of the, uh, the documents required for that property so that you can facilitate those firm offers. All right. Okay, I think I've got somebody raising their hand. Let me see if I can, you can unmute yourself. So if you want to talk to me, I'm here. I think your mic is on. Maybe I just clicked it. Maybe I just muted you again. Okay, can, can, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yes, hi. Hi, hi, Jane. I would like to know if if an offer is accepted with certain condition, uh, which are like longer than those uh, some standard clauses, like some repair in the property or so, some sort of uh, things we, for which the clause is not available. Is that also done on Schedule uh, A, or what what uh, what form do you use for that for special like? A condition where some works to be done on property after yes. purchase. 
So that might not be a condition. So say, for example, you have an offer that's been accepted conditional on an inspection and there's repair work that's discovered during the course of the inspection. If the seller is willing to do that, you can either have a verbal agreement separately or you might want to add it as an amendment to the agreement of purchase and sale. Okay, thank you. That's a, so amendment would be more appropriate rather than just putting as a condition. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, because otherwise you're opening up that offer again. Um, so it would just be, you know, repairs need to be done on or before closing. And it's a guarantee that the seller will do it. Okay, okay. By way thank of you. amendment, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. <laughs> Good stuff. Anybody else have any questions? Let me know. Um, again, I know there was a lot to cover with today's webinar, which is why I wanted to do this separately. It's sort of um, hard to throw in all of this into a working with buyers or working with sellers. This way we can talk about just the multiple offer situation um, exclusively um, on both sides. All right, so let me know if any other questions need to be answered. Um, does number of showings indicate to multiply offer scenario? Um, sorry, I'm not sure here um, what that means. Does number of showings indicate to multiply offer scenario? Um, does number of showings, like a large amount of showings, indicate that there will definitely be multiple offers? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, there might be a lot of people through the property. Um, maybe the MLS photos look amazing and then they show up and it's not so much. So not necessarily, but you will be informed of, uh, you know, multiple offers as the offers come in, if you've shown the property or if you've submitted an offer on it. Hopefully that answers your question. Sorry, not sure if I understood that correctly. Um, what kind of support does the Zolo office offer sellers agents? Uh, so, of course, you have your growth managers. They can literally hold your hand throughout the whole process. If you have a situation that you're not sure of, reach out to your growth manager, ask the questions. They'll get back to you. Um, yeah, because every situation is different in real estate. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you're thrown a situation that you don't know how to deal with, definitely reach out to your growth manager and they can help you. Awesome. Okay, well, I think I got to everybody. I hope you guys... Um, found that useful. Let me know later if you have comments, other things that, uh, you know, maybe you've learned along the way that I should include um, in these webinars. And um, that's it for today. I will see you on the next webinar. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye, guys.